tonight we're, our last class is on Hindu fundamentalism. Um, when many people in the West think of Hinduism, they often don't think of fundamentalism. Um, it's largely due to the fact, especially in the 60s, it was presented as a religion of tolerance, which can incorporate within its fold numerous beliefs. Uh, and there's a lot of truth in this, but like all religions, and remember, all religions have their fundamentalist uh, uh, elements. There are elements within it that are more narrow and rigid in their views. Uh, and which, and this is important, under certain historical conditions, we find coming to the fore. This is often true of most fundamentalist groups. It takes a certain historical condition for them to come to the fore. Um, also, it's probably this nonviolent image of Hinduism that came through uh, Gandhi. Everyone thought that, uh, that Gandhi represented all of Hinduism, uh, but this is by no means universal. There have been numerous uh, times in Indian history when violence has been exhibited in the name of protecting religion. It's one of the common uh, elements of fundamentalism. Uh, two instances being what was known as the Great Revolt of 1857, and I'll say something about that in a moment. And then the emergence of terrorist groups during the Indian independence struggle. If, if you, how many people saw the movie Gandhi? You remember there was one scene where the train was bombed? You, maybe you don't remember that. But those were ter there were terrorist groups that were, and he was opposed to those, but some argue that they had just as much influence on the independence movement as Gandhi. So in any case, this idea that Hinduism is gentle and sweet and partly true, but like any other religion, elements where that isn't necessarily the case. So contemporary Hindu fundamentalism is grounded in two major historical events. One, British colonialism, and two, the Indian Muslim desire for the creation of the state of Pakistan. So we'll look at each of these in a little more detail. So as part of the, what is known as the British Imperial Project, beginning around 1830s, Christian evangelical missionaries attempted, with government support, to make inroads into Hindu society by means of both conversion and social reform. Conversion remained minimal, but there was a great impact in terms of social reform, especially amongst educated Hindus. Uh, a number of them took the challenge seriously and began to press for reform within Hindu society, forming organizations like uh, the Brahmo Samaj, which was founded by this gentleman, Ram Mohan Roy. He was a high standing Brahmin, priestly caste, um, and this society pushed for reform of certain customs of the time found in popular Hinduism, such as sati, is it sati, the immolation of females on, on the pyre, um, untouchability, uh, and animal sacrifice. So there were reformers. As, now remember, this was a reaction to British attempts to convert and to say, well, this Hinduism is barbaric because it has these things. And a lot of the higher caste uh, agreed, so they, they created these social reform movements. Um, but there was another response. There was a conservative response. So that was the more liberal response. There was a conservative response to such British, and they saw these as British-inspired reforms, which said Hinduism is in danger. We heard that before, okay? Hinduism is in danger. Uh, indeed, many scholars have argued that the Great Revolt of 1857 that spread across India was primarily a result of this fear. It began May 10th, 1857, in the form of a sepoy mutiny. The sepoys were the uh, Indian soldiers in the British Army. You gotta remember that the English ruled India basically with Indian soldiers. The art, but none of those soldiers were who, what? Officers, 
All the officers were British, the soldiers were sepoy or Indian. But a, a revolt broke out in the town 40 miles northeast of Delhi, and then it quickly erupted into mutinies across the entire northern part of the country, even stretching into the center. Now, there were a number of political causes, but the final spark was this baby. The introduction of a new rifle called the Enfield 1853 Musket. Why was that so important? These rifles had what they call mini balls, a type of hollow base bullet that had a tighter fit than earlier muskets and used gunpowder from paper cartridges, which had to be poured into the musket. But these paper cartridges were greased. They had a grease seal on them, made of pig fat, and beef fat. Do you see what the problem might be for a Hindu soldier? And what spread was this was done on purpose. This was done on purpose to depurify Hindus, get them out, because this will get you out of your caste, and then make it more likely to convert. Whether that's true or not, this is what was p passed around and believed. So the grease was a tallow derived from beef. And it, this, this revolt lasted for well over two years. And there were numerous atrocities on both sides. The, uh, the one on the left shows uh, one of the uh, 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 atrocities that took place, slaughtering uh, British uh, civilians in a city. The one on the right. Can you see what that is? Those are cannons. What were they being used for? Those who were captured were put in them and fired out of them. <laughs> yeah. Stuffed into the barrel and then... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, there were atrocities on both sides. If you ever read about the mutiny of 1857, it was extremely violent on both sides. The one on the left was called the uh, uh, Mascot Kanpur, where men, women, children were killed. And this lasted for two years. It's interesting. Later Indian nationalists came to refer to it not as a mutiny, but as the first war of independence. It's always interesting what you name something. Names have power. So if you call something just a mutiny, what does that mean? Well, it was just some soldiers who were upset. First war of independence. After this, for the next two decades, the British pretty much went hands off <laughs> they did, uh, in terms of social reform. They thought, well, a lot of uh, in Parliament arguments were that they pushed too hard, and this was the result. You don't need to do this. We're really in India for economic benefit. We don't need to change society. That was one of the arguments. And for two years, that, that, that happened. There was a handoff policy. But then there was something that emerged called the white man's burden. Has anyone heard of that? The white man's burden. Uh, again, to push conversion and social reform. The idea proposed that the white race was morally obliged to civilize the non-white people of the earth and to uh, encourage their progress, economic, social, cultural, through colonialism. The implication, of course, was that the empire existed not for the benefit of Britain, but in order that primitive peoples incapable of self-government could, with British guidance, eventually become civilized. And that, yes, right. And that's why it took so long during the nationalist movement for government to be handed over. They weren't ready. That was always, that was always. Heard of this gentleman? Rudyard Kipling. Famous poem, Take Up the White Man's Burden. Here, it, here are the opening lines. Take up the white man's burden. Send for the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. 
to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. It's called paternalism. It, it was a, this was the policy. It, and it's, but well, you see what's interesting about this? This is taking a moral position. We are doing this for the up, uprising, uh, not uprising, but raising up of the morality of these people. And this was going on across the British Empire, very much in India. Anyway, so at this time, we find one of the first nationwide conservative Hindu responses in the form of an organization known as the Arya Samaj, or Society of Aryas. Aryan, you know the term Aryan? We tend to identify that with the Nazis, perhaps. The Aryan language group was, came down right into India, spread to across Europe, the Indo-Aryan language group. And so this Ary, the Indians considered themselves Aryans. And so this was the Arya Samaj. Uh, it was founded by this gentleman, Dayananda Saraswati. And what's interesting is this Samaj tried to turn the tables on Christian evangelicals by claiming that the Hindu texts known as the Vedas contained infallible divine guidance for all Hindus, indeed for all mankind. Do you see what they were doing? They were just, because many of the, of course, the Christian missionaries are saying the Bible is, is the word of God. It's got everything. They said, no, we've got, and his argument, our texts are much older. These texts go back 2,000 years. Went in so far as to try and find anything modern in the text. So you could find anything you wanted in the Vedas. So it's, a, it's an interesting reaction, to, and it's a very conservative one. Um, and that it predated the Bible, it proved they were superior. It, it, the movement became known as Back to the Vedas. Our problem is, and we've seen this before, haven't we? We got away from the Vedas. Remember that golden age mentality? We have to go back to the purity of whatever. And in the case of Hinduism, it's back to the purity of the Vedas. Uh, another significant aspect of this movement uh, was an attempt at reconversion. Anybody who had converted, we go out and we will reconvert them back to Hinduism. It was called the Shuddhi movement. Shud in Hinduism, in Hindi means pure. Pure. Back to purity. So there was big movement to go. Anyone who had converted to Christianity or even to Islam, these groups went out to reconvert them, to bring them back into the Hindu fold. Uh, special reconversion units were established, and over the few next uh, decades, it spread, and lots, there was lots of reconversion. Thus, in 1923, this gentleman, Swami Shraddhananda, founded the Bharatiya Hindu Shuddhi Mahasab, the Indian Hindu Purification Council. That term purity has come up time and again with fundamentalist, fundamentalist movements, right? We have to get back to original purity. So in 1928, many Catholics in Goa were reconverted to Hinduism. If you know that Goa was a big area for Catholic conversion. That was one of their target areas, and many reconversions took place. So that's the one element of these more conservative, what we would call fundamentalist groups, a reaction to British colonialism. The second had to do with Hindu-Islamic relations, now, there's always been sort of a tenuous relationship between the two communities historically, but there have also been long periods of harmony. Uh, for example, in the 16th century, the Mughal Emperor Akbar, who was a Muslim, in order to preserve peace and order, had religious cultural diversity at his court. He supported Hindu temples. So it's, it's always been there. Periodically, something will happen historically which will bring the conflict to a head. 
Even today, if you go to most Hindus, you can find a mosque right near a temple. It's not always conflict. But what in the modern period brought the flare? The desire for Muslims to create a separate state in the Indian nationalist movement. They wanted their own country. They didn't want just India. They wanted Pakistan. And as we know, that's what they will eventually get. Um, so as early as the 1920s and 30s, there were communal hostilities starting because this was the nationalist movement, beginning of the 20th century. Hostilities began to emerge. There was violence and bloodshed. And it was during this period in 1925 that this movement, known as the Rashtriya Swamvayak Sangh, or the RSS, which was a national patriotic organization, was founded by this gentleman. What was the purpose of this organization? To combat Islam, fundamentally. While the earlier movements were anti-colonial, anti-British, the later movements in Hindu fundamentalism are anti-Islam. It was a social, cultural organization to oppose both colonialism and Muslim separatism. He based many of his teachings on the beliefs of this gentleman, V.D. Savakar, who considered both the British and the Muslims to be foreign invaders. According to Savakar, the Indian subcontinent is the motherland of the Hindus. This is our land. What has happened to it over the centuries? Foreign elements have come in, tried to conquer us, not only, not only to conquer us politically, but try to do what? Take our religion away, convert us. Yeah. Um, another organization which developed during this time was known as the Hindu Mahasabha, or Hindu Assembly. It broadly supported the Indian National Congress, which was the main political body leading the independence movement. But it criticized the Congress commitment to nonviolence. Because who was leading the Congress for so many of those years? Gandhi. You know. he said, we can ask the British to leave. We can ask the Muslims to not. That's not, what are they going to say? No. <laughs> you only get people that, their argument was, if you don't use violence, and they quoted the Bhagavad Gita. Gandhi always interpreted the Gita as nonviolent. But do you remember the story of the Gita? Arjun is on the field, he's ready to do battle, and he's having these problems, and then it ends up, do, do your duty, do your battle. Gandhi said, that's a battle in here. They said, no, 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 no. It might be in here, but it's also out there. <laughs> you want to get rid of the British? How did the British conquer us? They didn't just come and ask. They took it. Okay. What are the Muslims going to do? They're just going to take part of India, create a new state with the British support. Now, um, both groups played active roles during this violent period, especially after independence when there was something called partition. The British finally decided, they threw their hands up, and they left. <laughs> And they allowed for partition. Gandhi said, no, we, we want one country. We can live together. The conservative Hindu society said, yes, no. Gandhi, in fact, went so far as to say, I'll make everyone in the cabinet a, cabinet a Muslim, okay, so that you don't leave. But uh, there was a man by the name of Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was the main Muslim spokesman for the creation of Pakistan. And uh, the British eventually supported this. And during this partition, now you've got to remember, there was one country called India. There were pockets of Muslims and pockets of Hindus in various areas. You form two countries. What are the Muslims in India going to try and do? Go to Pakistan. What are the Hindus in Pakistan going to do? Come down into India. 
and there was great mass. They figure close to a million people were killed during partition. Trains crossing each other being attacked. And it got very, very violent. Um, now what's interesting, uh, this, has anyone ever heard of this gentleman? Most people have not. This is a good final Jeopardy answer. Mataram Godse. He was Gandhi's assassin. He was Gandhi. He was a former member of the RSS and an active member of the Hindu Mahasabha. Why would he want to kill Gandhi? Well, this is what he said at his trial. Gandhi is being referred to as the father of the nation. But if that is so, he had failed his paternal duty inasmuch as he acted treacherously to the nation by his consenting to the partitioning of it, which was not true. I stoutly maintain that Gandhi has failed in his duty, his dharma. He has proved to be the father of Pakistan. I do say that my shots were fired at the person whose policy and action had brought rack and ruin and destruction to millions of Hindus. I now stand before the court to accept the full share of my responsibility for what I have done. And the judge would, of course, pass against me such orders of sentence as may be considered proper. But I would like to add that I do not desire any mercy to be shown to me. Nor do I wish that anyone else should beg for mercy on my behalf. My confidence about the moral side of my action has not been shaken even by the criticism leveled against it on all sides. I have no doubt that honest writers of history will weigh my act and find the true value thereof someday in the future. Now, what is very interesting, if you know what's going on in India today, for many, he is now a hero. And he belonged to the same organization that at one time was, who was a member, the Prime Minister of India. So there's been a big conservative backlash that's been going on. But, yep. So he was a member of this group. So in terms of the contemporary scene, Hindu fundamentalism is encapsulated by the term Hindutva, Hindutva, which is represented by a number of right-wing organizations. Uh, don't have to name them all. But three or four very powerful right-wing political religious organizations back this movement called Hindutva. One of the leading proponents was the earlier mentioned uh, M.S. Goldfar. He believed that India's diversity in terms of customs, tradition, and ways of worship was its uniqueness. Moreover, this diversity was built on an underlying cultural foundation, which was Hinduism. What he was essentially arguing is that everyone in India is really a Hindu, even though they may have ado adapted some foreign elements. You're all Hindu. Modi really played on this. It's a, you see, nationalism. Okay? Nationalism tied in with religion. He believed that native Hindus shared, among other things, the same philosophy of life, same values, same aspirations, which formed a strong cultural and civilized basis for the nation. Remember how we've seen other fundamentalist groups move into the political arena? We saw it in Christianity, we, we saw it in Islam. Same taking place here. So this, is in, it, this movement took center stage, uh, you may remember this, in 1992. Can anyone remember that far back? Uh, in what came to be known as the Barbary Mosque incident. Oh, that was good. Anyone remember this? At which a Muslim mosque in the city of Ayodhya was destroyed during a Hindu rally, a Hindutva rally, despite commitment by the Indian Supreme Court that the mosque would not be harmed. Why were they harming the mosque? Well, Ayodhya 
is a city revered by Hindus as the birthplace of Lord Rama. He com let's say, if you want to compare it to um, Bethlehem. And this is where the Lord Rama, an avatar of Vishnu, was born. And there was a, originally on the site where the mosque is, there was a Hindu temple to Rama. And centuries before, when the Muslims came in, under the more conservative Aurangzeb, they destroyed that mosque, I mean that temple, and built a mosque. So what's this Hindu organization doing in return? Going to destroy the mosque to rebuild the temple. It's very interesting if you look at conquest. One of the first things conquering peoples often do, they find the sacred spot, destroy it, and put their own sacred spot on top of it. It sort of gives you, you know, somehow God must be on our side. So this was known as the Babri Mosque Institute. Well, when you go around destroying sacred sites, you're usually going to get a reaction. And there were riots across India. 150,000 people were injured. 2,000 killed cities across India. This is one of these periodic Muslim-Hindu conflicts. You know another, another incident that often causes a riot or a conflict in a city? Muslim killing of a cow. Because Muslims eat beef. And if you want to get a Hindu, if you want to start a riot in a city, <laughs> and you're a Muslim, you just parade, you just slaughter cows. And in any case. Uh, so, um, so according to the World Hindu Council, the mosque, built since 1527, was really a replacement for the holy spot of Rama. And they took it to court, and a three-judge bench was uh, not unanimous. They, they were, they, there's disputes over the structure. But they did admit that there was a Hindu temple that predated the mosque. After the mosque's destruction, and it wasn't totally destroyed, but it was, it was, uh, it was Parts of it were completely destroyed. Uh, the Hindu World Council vowed to be in construction of a new Hindu temple to Rama. Not only are we going to attack the mosque, we're going to build a new temple to Rama on that site. Um, now, what's interesting, this is part of this came from a story that the Hindu watchman at the temple site, Rama had appeared to him and said, rebuild the temple. So this, this vision. So uh, over the following years, conflict continued. 900 lives, 90% of which were Muslim, were lost. Then on February, this is the one you may remember, 2002, February 27, 2002, a Muslim mob set fire to a train containing Hindu workers that were coming back from constructing the new temple to Rama. 58 people were burned alive. What do you think the result of that was? Well, Hindus in the local area just went out and started massacring Muslims, whether they were involved or not, especially in the big slums. The following morning, 6,500 Hindus retaliated by setting alight a local slum in which 65 Muslims were burned to death while sleeping in their homes. An investigation into the dispute resulted in a three-judge panel ruling that the land should be divided into three groups. So that the board decided there would be something called the Ram Lala. Well, that's that one back there. A Hindu group that worships Rama and tends to the idol of the god, they'd get one part of the site. And the statue of Rama would be allowed to stay there. The other two thirds would go to one to a Sunni group and another to another Hindu group. So to try and divide this one area up into three. There has been periodic violence since that time. But the conservative Hindu fundamentalists still claim this is 
our sacred site. Where else do you find issues like that? Jerusalem, right? This is our sacred site. Yeah. So in recent years, there's also been a sharp increase in violent attacks on Christians by right-wing Hindus. In 1997, 24 incidents were reported, and in 2000, the number had risen to over 90. Acts of violence were often accompanied by forcible reconversion to Hinduism and the destruction of Christian cemeteries. Foreign missionaries have mostly been targets. I don't know if you remember this gentleman. Australian. Graham Staines, Australian missionary, was burnt to death while he was sleeping with his two sons, aged nine and seven, in a village in Orissa. His two sons and he were burned to death. The followers of Hindutva are known for their criticism of the Indian government for not protecting native Hindu traditions holy structures, and the cow. Now, when Modi came to power, a lot of this has changed. The government is much more active in promoting Hindutva. Hindutva. There's a call to a return for Ram Raja. That's the idea of the golden age when Rama ruled. We have to go back to the golden age. But as Daniel Gold notes in his work called Organized Hinduism, the religious forces at work in forging together the Hindu nation thus differ substantially from those of traditional Hinduism. The Hinduism of ritual and law displays an extreme preoccupation with cosmic order on earth, the concern for following codes of behavior deemed divinely ordained and morally proper. Building the Hindu nation, by contrast, demands staunch identification with the group, an evocation of group loyalty, assertiveness that need not inherently respect traditional Hinduism. Subscribers to Hindutva talk about the restoration of Ram Rajya, the legendary rule of Ram, where a perfect monarch upheld Hindu rule on earth, while Hindu fundamentalists espouse Hindu virtues, the religious force behind what they do presses first of all for Hindu rule. Hindu rule. Nevertheless, over the past decades, fundamentalists have systematically infiltrated state machinery. From, and interesting, if you want to compare this, that what took place in this country, starting at the local level. Get control locally, then gradually build up to nationality. Um, as part of this attempt, Hindu groups have also been extremely active in attempts to rewrite Indian history. If you control history, <laughs> I think it was Mao who said, one generation, one generation, that's all I need, rewrite the history, which argues that the Indo-European language family, the one which I mentioned, originated in the subcontinent and spread outward, where the traditional and mostly accepted scholarly view is it started outward and came in. Do you see what this is trying to do? Ooh, we're the center and we spread out. Uh, it's, and therefore it's, uh, it's very controversial in academia, but what's, who, who's come under attack? Historians, intellectuals, because they're traitors. They don't support Hindutva. 
Uh, just recently, the Indian government has been accused of rewriting history to fit its agenda, especially with school textbooks. It does. Well, this is, this is a pattern. This is what you do. You rewrite the history. You teach the youth. You don't put in the textbooks things that, that, that you don't want. Um, for example, uh, they remove references to Gandhi's opposition to Hindu nationalism, as well as mention of controversial religious riot in which the prime minister, I don't know if I have him, Narendra Modi, former RSS member, was implicated. I don't have his picture there on that. So you just rewrite the history, you get political control, and then, especially if you can get the economy going, which Modi has done, then you get more and more support. Um, text work were revised to remove chapters on the history of the Mughals, the Muslim rulers who controlled much of the country for three centuries. There's also been a response for the banning of several, West, several Western works of scholarship on the grounds that they are based on, quote, imperialistic models that could not be applied to Hindu history, religion, and culture. You can't write about Indian history, religion, and culture unless you're a Hindu. That's the basic approach. That isn't something, this is something going on in many different areas, not just in, you can't write about women unless you're a woman. You can't write about Latinos unless you're a Latino. You can't write about blacks unless you're a black. Okay? So this has been going on. Very good friend of mine, uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who's a professor at uh, Rice University in Houston, wrote a book called Kali's Child. It actually won the American Academy of Religion History Prize for the best first book of 1995. Unfortunately, Jeff tried to look at the 19th century Hindu saint Ramakrishna from a Freudian point of view. <laughs> and the reaction amongst conservative Hindus was, uh-uh. This is, this is cultural imperialism. What would Freud know about Ramakrishna? In any case, it went so far as to Jeff getting death threats. Because there's a very powerful diaspora movement in this country, Hindu diaspora movement, very conservative. Most of them not trained scholars, most of them engineers, but they have a lot of money and a lot of influence. This book was banned. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, another gentleman I know by the name of Paul Court Courtright, who is at Emory, wrote a book on Ganesha, the Hindu god, the, elephant-headed god, dared to suggest that the trunk might be an erotic symbol. Of course, this was highly criticized. Okay, the one I want, this is interesting. There's something called the Ram Setu Bridge Controversy. What is that? Why, the government had proposed a project that would create an 83 kilometer long deep water channel between India and Sri Lanka. Okay. It would cut travel time by about 350 nautical miles and also save 10 to 30 hours of sailing time and really bring down shipping costs. So this was the project. However, it involved dredging and the removal of limestone shoals known as the Ram say to bridge. Can you see it there? Which Hindu legend claimed was the place where the Lord Rama crossed over when he was going to Sri Lanka in the myth to save Sita. Therefore, it's a holy site. They said it should be declared a national monument and up to this date it is still being worked out. Okay? Because it was in the myth as a holy site, it can't be touched. 
At one time, this would have, wouldn't have flown. But under Modi, because he realizes his political base is conservative Hindu. <laughs> okay. Uh, just a bit of conclusion here, and then we'll take some, some comments about any of the uh, presentations. Um, let, briefly, can you remember the basic characteristics? If you don't remember anything else, can you remember? And since uh, Elbert wasn't here, the free, why don't we educate him as to <laughs> what were, can anyone remember any of the, I think I gave six characteristics of fundamentalism across the board. And this was from the University of Chicago study. Yeah. Literal, literal interpretation, literal inerrantist. Okay, that's one. Yeah, our group is right. We, we're the only ones who have the truth. The chosen people uh, approach, yeah. How about some demonization in there? Demonization of the other. The other guy, it's, yeah, and it's a battle. And at some levels it can seem to be a cosmic battle, which brings in eschatology, right, at the end of times. Right? Um, how about the way scripture is looked at outside of just literally selectivity? Yeah. You find certain, you don't look at the scripture as a whole. You don't look at the context as a whole. You take a certain part, and generally that'll have some sort of political implication. Yeah. Yeah. One that I've mentioned many times tonight golden age, purity, backwards, change is bad. We ha that's why things are not good, because we've gotten away from the purity of, of it. And then finally, charismatic authoritarian leadership. Male. Male. <coughs> Generally male, yeah. Generally male. And uh, this can be religious, and it can merge into the political. Okay. Modi is a very powerful authoritarian charismatic leader. And he has ties with the RSS. And he has ties with the old Hindu Mahasabha. So those, those are the conditions. So uh, just in conclusion, it seems pretty obvious to me that uh, such an approach to religion, while perhaps assuring for the individual tribe concerned some security, also creates division, hostility, undermines the future prospect of cultural understanding and perhaps even world peace. So from my perspective, and it's my perspective, fundamentalism is a problem. Not, and it's a, the one with this class should show, it's across the board. It's in all religious traditions. There's some understanding of it because there's a fear of change. People don't like change. and. We live in a period of dramatic change, so there's a tendency to want to hold on tight, circling of the wagons. Um, I would say that along with climate change, uh, these two present the greatest challenge to mankind. That's my view. Because what people will do things in the name of their religion, especially if there's political implications, that we, well, we, we've seen it historically. Uh, and we're going to be dealing with this in our Future of Religion uh, Symposium. Religion isn't going away, OK? Because there's always, I think, a need within humanity to have some sort of connection with something larger than yourself. So religion isn't going away. So what we have to try and work for is religion that is not destructive that brings us together. And that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge. Uh, I'd like to think, uh, for example, my grandson might be able to appreciate the beauty of biblical passages, Quranic passages, Gita passages, Buddhist passages, and that his God-given critical intelligence <laughs> would uh, be used to evaluate. And we got to trust our ability to evaluate. Once we lose that, then what do we do? Tell me the answer. And there'll always be some charismatic leader to tell you the answer. There'll always be. And that's why I always admire when Reverend Elbert says, this is my view. What's yours? 
Now he's had training in the tradition, but still, that's very different from getting up and saying, this is what it says, remember it, spit it back, and don't forget it. Okay. Uh, any case, uh, so I look forward, hopefully, to the, to the day when we can have some sort of religious unity. That's why I do what I do, to what little consequence it is. Thank you for the series. Uh, we're off until September.